Good morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's program. Please stay tuned to the end of today's program for a brief update on our upcoming programs. We have a great lineup. For those of you who aren't yet members of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall, please consider becoming a member. There are some terrific benefits. So find out about them by going to our website at lawacth.org and sign up today. For those of you who would like to submit questions for today's program, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program, which will start in about 30 or 35 minutes. I am pleased now to introduce today's program. We welcome economist Ishwar Prashad. He is the Tolani Senior Professor of Trade Policy at Cornell University. He is also a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, where he holds the New Century Chair in International Economics. Today, Professor Prashad will be talking about his new book, The Future of Money, How the Digital Revolution is Transforming Currencies and Finance. Moderating today's conversation is Frank Motek, an award-winning journalist who hosts Motek on Money, weeknights on KABC Radio in Los Angeles. Frank, let me bring you on. It's so great to have you moderating today's program. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President, Kim McClary, for that kind introduction and greetings from Beverly Hills to our global audience for this important and timely discussion on the future of money and how the digital revolution is transforming currency and finance. I'm joined by the author of the book, The uh, Future of Money, Dr. Ishwar Prasad. Dr. Prasad, thank you very much uh, for making this event uh, possible here today. And a big part of uh, the conversation today will be about uh, cryptocurrencies, including uh, Bitcoin, which has its uh, big fans and uh, big skeptics. Uh, I think everyone is eager to further their understanding of uh, cryptocurrencies and the growing list of coins out there, as well as the underlying uh, blockchain technology. El Salvador, as you know, recently adopted Bitcoin as a national currency, and others are considering similar moves. Ishwar, let me start with the question now. Uh, how do you see the future of our money as a fintech and the digital revolution uh, transform the world of finance uh, and currencies, first of all? That's a very broad and expansive question, Frank, but uh, let me begin by thanking the Los Angeles World Affairs Council for arranging this talk um, uh, on my book. And, um, you know, Frank, when I started working on this book, uh, my intention was to write a book about what I think is coming, which is central bank digital currencies. In other words, I think the day is not that far away when the dollar bills in our billfolds might um, uh, give way to digital forms of the dollar. But as I started working on the book, some of the issues you referred to, fintech changes and broader changes in financial markets, um, I could see were going to play a very important role as well, which is why what was meant to be a small book turned into a 500 page tome. Um, the changes that are coming and that are in fact already in place in many countries around the world are quite dramatic. And I think the biggest change is a move towards digital payments. Um, that essentially means that, um, you know, either using the swipe of a card or a phone, you can make payments without having to rely on uh, paper currency, physical cash, that is. Um, and this transformation has been taking place not just in some of the advanced economies, but in many um, low-income countries, as well as middle-income countries, such as China. Um, so I think one of the things that became clear to me in the process of writing the book is that cash is not going to have much of a future as these digital payment systems proliferate. But there are other changes as well in store as a result of financial technologies. The fact that savers and borrowers can be more directly connected through fintech platforms. Uh, fintech is basically just a word for the new financial technologies. Um, so fintech is really, I think, playing an important role in terms of democratizing finance by making many of these products and services more broadly accessible and available. So there is a lot that's exciting that's going on. 
Doug Brissell, let me ask you, uh, there's a debate over whether a cryptocurrency is really a currency. Uh, is it a currency in your view or, or a commodity, uh, as some are insisting? Now, um, uh, we go back to the um, origins, of course, of cryptocurrencies, which date back to early 2009, which is when Bitcoin was first released. Actually, the concept paper underlying Bitcoin was released in October of 2008, just a few weeks after the so-called Lehman moment, when um, uh, the iconic bank Lehman um, came apart and almost took down the entire financial system in the US along with it. Um, that was a time that was ripe for this innovation because it was a time when trust in the central bank and governments and trust in financial institutions, such as commercial banks was really at a very low ebb. And Bitcoin came along with this promise that it could be used to conduct transactions without having to rely on um, paper currency or without having to rely on an intermediary such as uh, a commercial bank. So that was a very alluring proposition. Bitcoin also had the promise that it could be used without revealing users to identities. That is, um, you could just uh, be a digital Frank and that could transact with me, digital Ishwar, and we may not know who uh, the actual transacting parties are. As a consequence, Bitcoin was initially used for more nefarious activities, but as it started gaining traction, people started trying to use Bitcoin for other transactions, but it turns out that Bitcoin has certain problems, and this is true of many other cryptocurrencies as well. First of all, it has very unstable value. It's like you went into a restaurant with a Bitcoin. Of course, now you can buy a lot with the Bitcoin, but in the early days, if you could go into a restaurant one day and get a fancy meal, and then another day go into the same restaurant and afford only a cup of coffee, that's not a great medium of exchange. In addition, it also turns out that Bitcoin is a little cumbersome to use, um, although that's getting easier over time. It's quite expensive to use, and it takes a few minutes for a transaction to be validated. Um, so it's not a great medium of exchange. Now, the irony is that while it was supposed to be a medium of exchange, that is to say something that could facilitate transactions uh, between cons consumers and businesses or consumers and consumers, it turns out that somewhat paradoxically, Bitcoin has instead become a pure speculative asset. So people hold on to Bitcoin right now, not because they wanted to conduct transactions, but because they think that its price can only go one way, which is up. So it has become essentially a pure speculative asset that doesn't have any intrinsic value. Um, but of course, Bitcoin adherents will tell you that one of the value propositions of Bitcoin is that it is scarce. Um, the computer algorithm that determines the creation of Bitcoin posits that there will ultimately be only 21 million Bitcoins. About 18 and a half million have been created so far. Whereas if you think about a fiat currency issued by a central bank, you know, such as the US dollar or the Japanese yen and so on, those central banks can go out and print as much of their money as they want. So Bitcoin adherents will tell you um, that Bitcoin should therefore preserve value compared to something like the US dollar because after all it is scarce. But to an economist like myself, scarcity by itself cannot be a durable source of value. Um, having said all this, uh, when I started working um, on the book, if I had instead uh, spent my time investing in Bitcoin, perhaps I'd be a richer man today. And for the uh, general audience, we're all trying to get a better understanding of blockchain technology and, and cryptocurrencies. Uh, I think adding to the confusion is the, the Bitcoin logo and the, and the coin that you sometimes see. Uh, some people still actually think that there is a physical Bitcoin but that is not the case. So uh, for, for the general audience, uh, maybe you can give us a, a, a cryptocurrency or a Bitcoin 101 uh, lesson here on, on exactly what is it? So Bitcoin is a purely digital object. So um, uh, while there might be pictorial representations uh, of it, it really exists only on the web. Now, the reality is that most money, except for the dollar bills in our um, bill folds, really exist only on the web. If you think of your bank account, your 401k, all of those really exist only in digital form. So the fact that Bitcoin is digital is not what set it, sets it apart. But what is striking about Bitcoin, whether or not it lasts as a speculative asset, is really the technology. And the technology is going to have transformative effects in various parts of finance. So how does Bitcoin work? Um, it turns out that uh, uh, what Bitcoin does is at one level remarkable. So if you think about, you know, the transactions that we may conduct through a bank account, 
that's all kept relatively private. Uh, but what Bitcoin does at some level is provide a radical amount of transparency. So the blockchain technology is essentially um, uh, technology that allows virtually every transaction using Bitcoin to be posted on digital ledgers that are available for the public to see and that are maintained on multiple computers and synchronized in real time. Um, so what the Bitcoin blockchain has is information about the balances that people have in their digital wallets. Now to set up a digital wallet, again, um, it's sort of like having um, uh, a user ID and a password. So everybody on the Bitcoin blockchain can see your user ID, but you need to know your password in order, able to, in order to be able to open up the digital wallet and use the Bitcoins in there. The other interesting aspect about uh, Bitcoin is that uh, um, all these transactions are posted on the public ledger and because of that transparency, there is some degree of security because if anybody tried to fiddle with one of those transactions, it would quickly be recognized as an invalid transaction because that blockchain is maintained on multiple computers around the world. Now, how do transactions using Bitcoin get validated? You know, when you go into a coffee shop, uh, pay with a $20 bill, that dollar bill goes into the um, uh, uh, barista still and the money is gone. So the payment is immediate and it is finalized and cannot be rolled back. So Bitcoin accomplishes this in a very interesting way. So if you and I wanted to transact with each other, we would post our transaction um, on the internet. And there are these people called miners who essentially have a lot of computing power who scoop up all these transactions, put them into a block and then somebody has to have the privilege of validating those transactions, making sure that those transactions are valid ones. And that privilege falls to people who are able to use computing power, which is what is called mining, in order to solve very complicated numerical problems generated automatically by the Bitcoin network. So the first person to solve that problem gets to check those transactions, validate them, and then those transactions are added to the existing block of transactions. So they're chained together, which is where the term blockchain comes from. So you have a block of transactions that are validated, new transactions are then appended to that blockchain. Um, so now you have a full record of all the transactions that are out there. And why do miners do this? Why do they expend computing power, energy to have the privilege of validating transactions? This again is the beauty of Bitcoin. The economists know that you need an incentive to accomplish anything. And the incentive here is you, if you're the first person to solve that problem and validate a block of transactions, you get a Bitcoin. So that's your reward. So essentially, you now have a system that works to validate transactions without a commercial bank or the central bank being involved. And that, in a sense, is the beauty of uh, Bitcoin. In approaching this subject early on, did you approach it with, uh, with skepticism or, or enthusiasm? So I was skeptical, um, you know, I was on the record a couple of uh, maybe three, four years ago as asserting that maybe if the technology improved, um, Bitcoin could eventually serve as a viable medium of exchange. Um, I argued that it could not really have much uh, uh, of a role as a store of value, that is, as a financial asset. Um, and at one level, exactly the opposite has happened. Like I said, Bitcoin is not working well as a medium of exchange. It is a um, financial asset. But you know, there are interesting changes coming that build upon Bitcoin. So right now, Bitcoin is not that widely used by, um, by uh, criminals for nefarious activities um, because it turns out that if you really want to hide your identity, you can't take some fairly sophisticated operations. So if you use Bitcoin a lot or you use Bitcoin to actually buy real goods or services, it turns out that your digital and your real identity can be connected. You know, we've heard about ransomware attacks right now, where the uh, hackers essentially demand payments in Bitcoin. They have to use very sophisticated uh, um, measures in order to really disguise their identities. But there are new cryptocurrencies that are emerging that offer more anonymity, but they're more cumbersome to use. A more interesting development is one that tries to solve this problem I referred to earlier, that this value of Bitcoin is very unstable. So there are new cryptocurrencies called stable coins and their um, uh, main uh, draw is that they have stable value. How do they accomplish stable value? It's by being backed up by stores of hard currencies such as the US dollar. 
So even Facebook has indicated that it plans to issue its own stable coin called DM. So Facebook says that for every unit of DM that it issues, it will be backed up by one US dollar worth of financial assets. So the idea here is that that stable coin can then be used using the blockchain technology to undertake very effective digital payments. Um, and Facebook, um, you, you may not trust Facebook, but it is going after a real problem that many people, even in a country like the US, don't have easy access to digital payments because you know here you can use Apple Pay, you can use a credit card, but you need a debit card, a credit card, or a bank account. And some of those are beyond the means of uh, many people. Um, international payments are even more complicated and time consuming. So Facebook says that I'm going to give you a stable coin that will allow me to use this technology to more effectively provide digital payments within a country and across a country's borders. So I think stable coins are going to have a little more of a future. But of course, again, there is an irony here that the whole point of Bitcoin was to get away from fiat currencies issued by central banks. But the um, premise behind stable coins is that their stable value comes because they are backed up by fiat currencies. Big fans of uh, cryptos and uh, Bitcoins, uh, they say, ha have the laser eyes on. And you might have seen uh, some of the, uh, the depictions of that. Uh, would you say that you have the laser eyes on? Well, it's a little difficult to take on Bitcoin adherence and argue that uh, um, they were wrong about Bitcoin's value because after all, uh, you know, the value of Bitcoin has increased quite, um, um, quite substantially. Um, so my view about Bitcoin is that whatever happens in terms of its value and whether it turns out to be a viable medium of exchange or a viable financial asset, the real legacy of Bitcoin is going to be, first of all, the technology that it has created that is really going to serve um, uh, for some important innovations in finance. And second, it is lighting a fire under central banks, including the US Federal Reserve, to start thinking about issuing digital versions of their own currencies, because it's now becoming clear there is a demand for this and the technology is there. Last time I checked, I think there's something like 12,000 uh, coins out there now. Uh, obviously, this is evolving very, very quickly. Uh, and innovation is in, in uh, uh, pedal to the metal here. Uh, what's been catching your attention among some of the new coins uh, and innovations uh, that have come up recently? So in addition to what I mentioned, that there are cryptocurrencies that try to solve some of these uh, um, problems related to uh, lack of true anonymity and unstable value. Um, there are others that try to become a little cleaner than Bitcoin. So one of the problems with this Bitcoin mining process that I described in uh, um, uh, very brief uh, detail um, is that it's enormously environmentally destructive. Just think about it. You have to be the first to solve these uh, uh, numerical problems. And it turns out there is no analytical way to solve these problems. The only way you can solve these problems, given their nature, is through brute computing power. So you need enormous amounts of computing power. Um, you've probably seen pictures of these mining rigs where lots of computers or specialized machines to do this uh, um, uh, solving of these uh, computational problems uh, are sort of chained together. So you need to have those uh, machines, um, which because they're used um, literally 24 hours uh, um, a day, seven days a week, burn out very quickly. So you have a lot of computer detritus. You need the energy to run those machines. You need energy to cool those machines. So the environmental impact of something like Bitcoin is really enormous in terms of energy consumption and computer detritus. But there are new cryptocurrencies that use more efficient ways um, to conduct the validation of these transactions that are not as environmentally destructive as Bitcoin. So for instance, the second most important cryptocurrency, Ethereum, is moving to a different consensus protocol, as it is called, for validating transactions that is going to be much more efficient and much cleaner. But of course, the world of cryptocurrencies is a wild one. There are cryptocurrencies like Dogecoin that seem to uh, rise and fall in value just on the basis of uh, tweets by personalities such as Elon Musk. And they don't serve any fundamental purpose, but people seem to believe that uh, given the technology underlying them, that they must have some sort of value. So there is a lot of funky stuff going on in the world of cryptocurrencies as well. Let me ask you this question, uh, since the name uh, came up, uh, who invented 
Bitcoin. Uh, we, we've heard a name out there, but but was it Elon Musk? You think? <laughs> um, we don't know. Um, so the original white paper, that is the proposal that set out uh, um, the technical uh, vision behind Bitcoin, was posted by a user with the user ID Satoshi uh, Nakamoto. We don't know if this is an individual or if it is a group of people. Um, there have been some uh, ostensible sightings of who the uh, true Satoshi Nakamoto might be. And there are you know, sort of digital fingerprints based on the way that paper was written. Um, but we don't really know yet. Um, for all I know, it could be uh, Elon Musk, but I suspect that Elon Musk is not the sort of person who would keep it a secret if he actually accomplished something as great uh, as uh, figuring out the technology underlying Bitcoin. And he has famously uh, tweeted about and uh, appeared on Saturday Night Live uh, and joked about uh, Dogecoin, which started uh, as a joke. And, and Mark Cuban uh, has also tweeted about it. Uh, what about Dogecoin uh, specifically? Uh, what do you see ahead for uh, for Doge? So Doge and other cryptocurrencies um, like that are really seem seem to be born out of whims. Um, you know, uh, people go out and uh, create uh, what are essentially meme-based coins. So as you know, um, there is this meme about the Shiba Inu dog, which is uh, the mascot of the Dogecoin. So Dogecoin doesn't even pretend to have uh, a substantive function. You know, when Bitcoin was created, it did have the ostensible objective of facilitating a medium of uh, uh, facilitating transactions as a medium of exchange without relying on a, um, a trusted third party. Um, Dogecoin um, doesn't have any clear objectives and there are many other cryptocurrencies of this sort that seem to be based on nothing more than means. So um, they shouldn't have any value on the fact that they have um, the sort of astounding values that we've seen in the millions, tens of millions, or in some cases, even billions of dollars just shows that uh, much like the tech boom, you know, in the early 2000s, people seem so convinced that this is the technology of the future that they are willing to ride the wave with even um, these very whimsical objects. So I, I don't see a big future for Dogecoin. Um, and my worry really is that, uh, you know, if one might say, um, if people want to go out and put money in Dogecoin, who's to stop them so long as they go in with their eyes wide open and uh, are aware of the risks, my concern is that there are some people, especially um, retail investors who might be somewhat uh, unclear about the risks, who join the party very late, and they're the ones who get burnt when uh, um, the value of these coins um, inevitably crashes, as I think will happen someday. So there is quite a bit of uh, bubble talk. It's been compared to the, to the tulip mania and, of course, the, the dot-com uh, crash and all that. Um, how do you see this uh, play out? Uh, I do talk to, to John Najarian frequently, who does have the laser eyes on it, and he made the point recently uh, on my program that um, uh, it's either Bitcoin or, or Ethereum, and the others uh, have to be uh, looked at with a, with a wary eye. That's right. As you mentioned, uh, um, there are, there's a huge number of cryptocurrencies right now, and it's hard to imagine all of these uh, um, existing much longer. Um, certainly these two main cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Ethereum, have a lot going for them. Ethereum in particular um, has a much more um, a functional blockchain that can allow for um, new sorts of financial products and services, including things called smart contracts, which might allow you and me, for instance, to conduct even more sophisticated transactions like, um, say, uh, you buying my house or me buying your car uh, without relying on real estate attorneys or um, settlement agents uh, and so on. Uh, so there is a lot that can happen on that front. But I think what is really going to be interesting to see is whether if we do have um, central bank digital currencies, that is digital versions of the dollar and so on, whether that is going to undercut the basic premise of many of these cryptocurrencies that you want more efficient uh, digital payments. Now, certainly for many people, um, there might be some allure to not having to rely on um, a currency that is issued by um, a central bank. Maybe they do want um, a private currency. And you know, um, Frank, as you step back and think about this from the long arc of history, to me, this is a very fascinating development over the last few years, because it turns out that, um, you know, the invention of money itself was quite a, a phenomenal uh, innovation in human society. And then paper currency first appeared in China in the um, 7th century. In uh, the 13th century, Kublai Khan uh, in China 
made paper currency legal tender. So it was unbacked by anything. So this was the first fiat currency. And then paper currencies went and came. But private uh, issuers of currency existed for a long time, and they used to compete with government currencies. The establishment of central banks, which was set up specifically to manage in an orderly way the issuance of money, basically wiped out most private currencies. So we've not had um, you know, major private currencies for a couple of hundred years now in the major economies. But now we are back in an era of currency competition between private currencies and fiat currencies. And as an economist, I would say that competition is usually a good thing. And I think maybe this will bring more discipline um, to the issuance of money by central banks. Maybe it will bring us all towards a world where digital payments are more easily accessible to everyone. Um, so I think this is um, beneficial competition at some level. Just recently, El Salvador became the first country to declare a Bitcoin legal tender along with the US dollar. Uh, anyone who downloaded that app there got uh, but uh, $30 in Bitcoin. What lessons uh, were learned from that uh, big uh, Bitcoin day in El Salvador recently? Now, certainly Bitcoin seems to be on a roll. Um, Despite the uh, problems that I indicated, you know, um, uh, AMC theaters has indicated that it's going to accept Bitcoin um, and a few other cryptocurrencies for payments, perhaps by the uh, end of this year. Um, El Salvador's adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender is seen as a landmark event. But El Salvador actually, uh, I think, is trying to fix uh, its own problems in this curious way. So El Salvador, because of the failings of its government, because it had very... Uh, undisciplined monetary policy. Um, the governments were essentially printing money to finance their government expenditures. Um, and that currency quickly lost value. So for a number of years, um, they've essentially used the dollar as their national currency. Um, now to nationalist leaders in any country, um, especially um, a country like El Salvador, the notion of relying on dollars to conduct commerce uh, never sat, sat, sat well with them. So this is sort of an idea of you know, overthrowing American hegemony of their monetary system by essentially riding the Bitcoin wave. And I think El Salvador's government, like a few others, uh, is also hoping um, that it, if it acquires a lot of Bitcoin right now and the value of Bitcoin goes up, that's going to help its government finances as well. Unfortunately for El Salvador's government, I think the problems with using Bitcoin as a medium of exchange um, are going to make it an unviable currency in that function. Um, and I think trying to make up for the government's failings, uh, for, the la for the fact that it doesn't have you know, very disciplined uh, fiscal or monetary policies just by adopting Bitcoin, I don't think it's going to work. So at some level, it's an act of desperation and uh, I wouldn't put my bet on El Salvador being able to pull this off and go into a glorious economic future just by adopting Bitcoin. Which countries are next as far as adopting a Bitcoin as legal tender? Uh, Cuba, Ukraine, maybe? You know, Venezuela has issued its own cryptocurrency and this happened um, uh, three or four years ago. And uh, what, they're, what they were hoping to do was set up a cryptocurrency which would allow um, foreign investors, foreign traders to trade with them and avoid or evade U.S. sanctions uh, on Venezuela. And I think the Venezuelan government was also hoping to ride uh, the Bitcoin wave to some extent and assume that while the value of its currency was plummeting, that somehow setting up its own cryptocurrency, uh, which was to be backed up by stores of uh, oil reserves, would somehow give it a better currency, uh, improve government revenues, and so on. Um, I think that, again, is likely to be um, a failed promise. So there might be some uh, other desperate governments that uh, uh, try to adopt Bitcoin if they don't have uh, functioning governments. There has been some talk of uh, uh, Afghanistan um, adopting Bitcoin as a medium of exchange when it doesn't have a functioning banking system. Um, so there might be a few other countries, but I don't think um, this is going to be a widespread phenomenon. But then if you start thinking about you know, the other forms of digital currencies issued by central banks, that is a growing movement. Um, already China, Sweden, Japan have started experimenting with their own digital currencies, that is digital versions of the Chinese uh, Yuan, of the uh, Japanese Yen, um, uh, and so forth. Um, but um, it's a movement that is really catching on fire right now. There are many central banks around the world, including the US Federal Reserve, that have all said that they are looking into the prospects of digitizing their own currencies. 
So that I think is going to be the movement that sweeps the world and could one day um, result in the elimination of cash. What do you think the, the timetable is here here in the U.S. with a lot of focus on the regulation of um, cryptos right now uh, on Capitol Hill? And uh, Charlie Gasparino, I see here, um, uh, commented about this recently. And uh, we've had him on again also. Uh, the, the young crypto industry uh, could grow if the SEC al allows it. Uh, securities regulators are looking into all this. Uh, uh, what timetable do you see um, the possibility of a digital currency uh, put out by the, the Federal Reserve? And, and uh, on the regulation question, uh, what do you see ahead? So um, the interesting thing about cryptocurrencies, again, is that um, some form of government um, uh, imprimatur gives them legitimacy. So as you know, um, in the U.S. right now, cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin are classified as financial assets. Um, so if the value of Bitcoin goes up, you're supposed to report those capital gains uh, to the IRS. Um, and that itself has given some degree of legitimacy to these cryptocurrencies because I think a lot of investors say, well, if um, the IRS recognizes it as a financial asset, it must be okay. Uh, but of course, um, that's not necessarily the case. But there are many concerns about um, uh, these cryptocurrencies and assets such as derivatives that are based on the prices of uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, one concern, as I mentioned, is investor protection. Um, uh, the fact that you have many um, uh, retail investors who might be um, somewhat naive, who might be uh, taken in by the razzle-dazzle of all this technology and not realize what sort of risks they're taking on, um, that is one issue. Another issue is the, um, is the fact that some of these cryptocurrencies um, seem to involve a lot of market manipulation. Um, where one cryptocurrency is used to drive up the price of another cryptocurrency, and then the people who sort of uh, pump things up end up dumping those cryptocurrencies. So um, these pump and dump schemes are rampant. And in fact, um, what is remarkable is that some of these operators actually announce that they're going to undertake pump and dump schemes and still um, they go on. Um, a third concern is related to um, this uh, issue of stable coins that I mentioned. You know, if you think about Facebook issuing um, a stable coin backed up by U.S. dollars, you might say, where is the risk in that? After all, if every unit of Facebook's cryptocurrency DM is backed up by dollars, then what's the risk? Um, but I think um, uh, Facebook is going to hold not just uh, actual dollars, but also a variety of securities. And one thing that we learned in the global financial crisis of 2008-2009 is that even seemingly very safe investments, such as in money market mutual funds, can very quickly turn sour if there is a financial market panic that causes the value of those securities to fall. So while Facebook might claim that its stable coin is really not the same thing as, an, uh, uh, as a money market mutual fund, in fact, there are some very similar risks that arise. And one other issue is that if you think about Facebook's uh, cryptocurrency or um, even any of these other cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, they make it much easier, um, even if not always trivial, um, to disguise illicit transactions across national borders. So you can think about money laundering, terrorism financing and all being um, uh, financed by that. So those are the sorts of problems that I think regulators are concerned about, not that there are risks, but that those risks might spill over into the broader financial system. You also asked, uh, uh, Frank, about the um, digital dollar. Um, the Federal Reserve System is going to release its first study about the technical feasibility of a digital dollar um, sometime in the next few days, as a matter of fact. Um, mm -hmm. And I think um, that paper will um, shed light on a variety of technical issues about how the digital dollar could be designed, what sort of risks there might be if the central bank itself started issuing a digital currency, um, how to deal with issues about privacy and confidentiality. Because, you know, if you start transacting with the digital payment system, anything digital at one level always leaves a trace. Uh, but of course, no central bank wants its money, especially digital money, to be used for um, uh, illicit uh, commercial activity. So how do you ensure the auditability and uh, traceability of transactions while at the same time giving users some privacy? These are issues that ultimately, you know, it's going to be uh, decided not just at the technocratic level or at the level of economists and policymakers, but as societies, we're going to have to contend 
with some of the changes that uh, a digital dollar might imply. We've heard uh, it said many times that uh, cryptos are used uh, for criminal activity. Well, couldn't be the same be said of cash? That is true. I mean, there are many advantages to CBDC. Um, first of all, um, it brings a lot of economic activity out of the shadows and into the tax net. Um, you know, some might consider that not such a good thing, um, but certainly it would make it a lot easier um, uh, to generate tax revenues from legitimate economic activities. Um, second, cash, as you correctly pointed out, is used um, um, for a lot of illicit activities, both domestically, but also cross-border, including drug trafficking and so on. You know, some petty corruption in many economies um, uh, still takes place in the form of cash. And if you think about businesses dealing with cash, you know, for them, it's a hassle. They have to make change. They have to actually uh, deal with the hassle of storing cash, uh, transporting cash to the bank. So there are concerns about loss, about theft. So cash has a number of disadvantages and the CBDC, uh, central bank digital currency, would certainly get over some of these issues. But a CBDC is not without its own potential problems. You know, if you have the central bank issuing uh, a digital currency, then private payment providers uh, who might be able to innovate and create more efficient payment systems, they're going to be uh, facing competition from effectively a government entity and who can compete with the government. You might also face a situation where, you know, if each of us had an account with the central bank, which is one form a CBDC might take, then especially during you know, difficult uh, financial times, um, if there is a financial panic in the economy, we might all decide that it's better to keep our money with the central bank rather than with the commercial bank, even if our bank deposits are insured. So flight of deposits from the banking system could actually uh, precipitate uh, financial instability. And then there is the privacy issue, um, uh, whether we can actually end up uh, with a situation where um, either a private payment provider or a government agency or the central bank is able to uh, gain visibility to every transaction uh, is a potential problem as well. So there are lots of benefits, but a few risks to be thought through as well. All very interesting points. Thank you for, uh, for those insights. And, and let me ask you this. We're speaking at a week where we saw uh, some wide moves in the financial markets uh, because of concern about this uh, Evergrande uh, company, uh, or entity, this developer in China possibly melting down and possibly China having a, a Lehman moment. We saw the worst one-day drop for the stock market uh, of the year uh, earlier this week, but since uh, an impressive rebound. And in that um, meltdown on Monday, we, we did see the, the cryptos also uh, pulled back and uh, gold moved up. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, is, is crypto a hedge uh, against uh, a global instability uh, and inflation, uh, which we're all uh, concerned about these days? Now, one thing the China episode certainly shows is that uh, um, uh, we've all become much more uh, interconnected in terms of global financial markets. What happens in China doesn't stay in China um, anymore. Um, it quickly infects U.S. markets as well. But I think the evidence of the last uh, um, few months um, doesn't um, give one much hope that a cryptocurrency can serve as a hedge either against inflation or against um, financial market troubles in the U.S. or elsewhere. Um, uh, but having said that, you know, there isn't a long price history on something like Bitcoin yet. It's, um, it was created in early 2009, but it's really only in the last four or five years that Bitcoin has really uh, taken off in terms of its valuation and um, had a lot of other cryptocurrencies follow through on its uh, coattails. Uh, but again, given that the a fundamental value proposition of Bitcoin seems to be scarcity rather than any intrinsic function that it uh, um, helps execute. Um, it's a little difficult for me to see um, Bitcoin as really serving as an effective hedge um, against either inflation or financial market troubles. Let me ask you, that: what do you see uh, for the future of gold and silver in all of this? And um, and I, I should also point out this idea has been floated again that this past week in Washington of the U.S. Treasury minting a one trillion dollar coin. Um, what are your thoughts about all that? Now, certainly, um, I, I think we are in very interesting times and propositions like that um, uh, are floated and uh, are treated with some degree of uh, seriousness, at least in um, uh, some circles. Um, I think um, there is a real desire um, among investors, um, uh, both domestic and foreign, to have some sort of asset 
where we can be uh, sure that it's going to preserve value. Um, and gold um, has traditionally um, served that function because people believe, again, given the scarcity and given the fact that um, uh, it can be produced only limited amounts each period, so that if supply rises, I'm sorry, if demand rises, supply cannot really um, increase immediately to catch up with it. That is going to help it preserve value. And again, the contrast is usually made with fiat currencies such as the dollar, which can be printed at will. And as we know, in the last few years, especially since the global financial crisis, um, the U.S. has been issuing a huge amount of government debt. The Federal Reserve has been printing a huge amount of uh, dollars. Um, so you would think that the dollar cannot possibly maintain its value relative to something scarce. But, you know, uh, Frank, one of the things that we've learned is that um, uh, the ability of the central bank to create this money and therefore provide what the economists call liquidity to the financial system makes it really valuable. Um, and if you think about what can cause financial panics, it's the lack of um, access to um, uh, cash flow. You know, there might be perfectly solvent firms that are not able to get over the hump because they have short term cash difficulties. What the Federal Reserve is very effective at doing is pumping cash into the economy when times are um, very rough. And that is going to give fiat currency some very important power. And ultimately, you know, um, fiat currency like the dollar um, is backed by the taxing power of the U.S. government. So the U.S. government says that uh, um, the dollar is legal tender, which means that you and I can pay taxes, in fact, have to pay taxes using dollars. Um, so it is the fact that the U.S. government stands behind the Federal Reserve and the fact that the Federal Reserve can use the dollar so effectively to prop up the financial system that gives it value. So I think for many investors, gold, Bitcoin uh, might well um, be attractive parts of their portfolios in order to have more diversification, but they are certainly going to be a lot more speculative in terms of their values compared to many other assets. We will now turn to the audience uh, for your questions now uh, for the next part of our program. And uh, assembling those questions for us is our virtual moderator, Jessica Duganzik from the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Jessica. Thank you so much, Frank and Dr. Prasad. Thank you. Before we launch into the questions, I just would like to thank our members and our viewers for all of your support. We depend upon your donations and membership to cover our expenses so that we can continue to bring you these important discussions. So if you are able to make a donation, please go to our website at lawacth.org and click on the donate button or become a member. We greatly appreciate it. All right, Dr. Prasad, um, you foresee the end of cash as central banks develop their own digital currencies to compete with Bitcoin and Facebook's DM. Does this mean all currencies will be on the line and will be online and subject to hacking and misadventure? Yeah, that is a legitimate concern. Now, first of all, um, let me make one observation, which is that every central bank that is contemplating the issuance of cash uh, says that at least for a while, um, uh, digital currencies will coexist with uh, um, physical uh, currency, that is uh, cash. Um, that is, they're not going to push out cash, but I think the reality is that as people get access to these low cost and very uh, easy to use uh, digital payment systems, um, which is what a CBDC would essentially be, organically, I think the use of cash will decline. But there is a concern about whether, first of all, uh, the uh, disappearance of cash might disenfranchise certain people. You know, when I walk into some of my uh, local coffee shops um, uh, or eateries, uh, they don't accept cash uh, anymore. Um, uh, so for, you know, for elderly people, for uh, people in rural areas or people who don't have digital connectivity, uh, there might be a real notion of disenfranchisement um, if you get rid of cash. So many of these central banks that are contemplating the issuance of CBDCs are in fact at the same time trying to make sure that cash remains viable. In fact, in the US, there is a, um, a, an act of Congress that is uh, um, on the books, although it's not been passed yet, uh, to preserve cash and make it uh, um, illegal for merchants uh, to say that they will not accept cash. But digital currencies certainly come with other problems. Uh, it's not just a lack of privacy, but as the questioner pointed out, um, you can well see them being much more vulnerable uh, to digital hacking. Um, so while um, you know, a merchant might find it 
um, complicated to deal with sums of money that uh, he or she has to take to the bank. There is a, a proneness to loss. Uh, you could have large scale digital hacks. So before we move in a serious way to a CBDC, I think the security um, of being able to undertake transactions with a CBDC, um, the security of the electronic or digital wallets in which those CBDC um, uh, uh, balances are maintained, those are going to be very difficult issues. But having said that, you know, uh, cryptography and other technologies are developing very fast um, that I think are going to make security um, less of a concern in the future, although it will never completely disappear because, of course, um, there are hackers with very strong incentives to try to break these very systems. Thank you. Can you talk about the cap on the number of Bitcoins and how this protects it from inflation? And what is the estimate for when all Bitcoins will be mined? So there is a, um, a hard cap that is posited by the algorithm of 21 million Bitcoins. So um, when Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever it was or whichever group it was, uh, designed the algorithm that was coded into the algorithm. So uh, Bitcoins are also created on a particular schedule that there is one Bitcoin that can be created every 10 minutes or so. So I spoke about how certain numerical problems have to be solved in order to uh, validate transactions on the Bitcoin network and thereby earn Bitcoin. So the, um, the difficulty of those numerical puzzles automatically adjusts so that only one Bitcoin can be created every 10 minutes. Um, so like I said, about uh, 18 and a half million Bitcoins have been uh, mined so far. So it's going to take um, uh, three or four decades, uh, actually maybe a couple of decades till we reach the point. And actually there is a very specific date um, that uh, uh, the Bitcoin production will actually cease. Uh, but um, it's going to go on um, for a number of years uh, till we reach that uh, point. Thank you. And does that protect it from inflation that there's this cap? Yeah, that is the um, belief of Bitcoin adherence, that if you have um, uh, scarcity of Bitcoin, that is going to preserve its value compared to something like the US dollar, which again can be printed in um, basically infinite amounts by um, the Fed. Um, and this is why Bitcoin is referred to as digital gold as well, because if you think about the overall stock of gold, um, uh, that cannot be increased anytime demand increases. So the supply of gold is constrained um, by various uh, factors. It's not easy to get gold out of the ground and to refine it um, into a form that it can be melted into bars and so forth. And the same is true at some level of Bitcoin that um, just because the price of Bitcoin rises, the supply of Bitcoin cannot rise because it is determined algorithmically. Uh, but to my original point, I think it's still worth thinking about whether scarcity by itself is enough to generate value. Just because something is scarce, is it going to remain valuable? Um, uh, again, Bitcoin adherents, uh, people who stoutly believe in gold, seem to believe that that is a fundamental value proposition that will always keep something like gold and Bitcoin from um, being subject to inflationary forces, unlike uh, fiat currencies. But I am not sure, at least as an economist, whether Bitcoin will stand this test of time compared to fiat currencies. Thank you. What will happen when all Bitcoin have been mined and miners have no incentive to continue verifying transactions? That's a very perceptive question. And in fact, um, um, Satoshi Nakamoto, again, whoever uh, that is, uh, uh, had thought about this problem. And in the um, uh, and you know, this original paper that set out the vision of Bitcoin is a remarkable document. It's just nine pages, but it set off what is essentially a revolution in money and finance. Um, uh, Nakamoto um, uh, apparently did anticipate this problem that at some point miners would no longer have an incentive, but it turns out that one of the problems with Bitcoin is that um, it can handle only a certain amount of transactions at a time. Um, so sometimes if, you, uh, if I wanted to buy um, you, Jessica, a cup of coffee, uh, we might post it using Bitcoin, we might post a transaction, but that transaction may get knocked down on the list of you because there are more uh, valuable transactions that are out there. So one way we could get the transaction validated within the next 10 minutes is to pay uh, miners a fee uh, for validating the transaction and sort of moving it up the queue. So Nakamoto's vision was that those transaction fees would essentially become the incentive for miners. 
So whoever managed to validate a block of transactions and expended resources in doing so would no longer get a Bitcoin as reward, but would get the transaction fees of all those who are willing to pay whatever transaction fees they wanted in order to get their um, prospective transactions moved up the queue. What federal regulatory agency currently regulates the activities of Bitcoin and other digital currencies here in the US? But that is again a very complex question and there is no clarity on the issue. As I mentioned, um, IRS, um, the IRS does require reporting um, of cryptocurrency holdings. Um, and there is a long debate about whether something like Bitcoin is actually a security or not. If Bitcoin were to be considered a security, then it would come under the um, regulatory ages of the um, Securities and Exchange Commission, um, the SEC. Uh, but the SEC has taken the position that uh, Bitcoin is not really um, a security, uh, but the CFTC, the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission, um, uh, views Bitcoin as a commodity, so it comes under the jurisdiction of the CFTC. Um, but the reality is that, um, you know, something like Bitcoin is not transacted through a bank or through a common financial institution. All of this stuff happens um, on the on the web through these connected uh, um, digital ledgers. So it's not clear who or what institution um, would actually be regulated. So what regulators have done is uh, something different. They have said that the exchanges on which uh, Bitcoin might be traded or Bitcoin related products might be traded are going to have some reporting requirements um, that would uh, reduce the risks on this. Any securities that try to bet on the price of Bitcoin so for instance, if you had an exchange traded fund um, that was based on the price of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, that would be a security that could then be regulated as a security. But it's still a very um, uh, open question about something like say Facebook's uh, stable coin DM, because it's not really a money market mutual fund, but it is um, uh, de facto going to behave like one. So. Uh, given that it's not registered as the money market mutual fund, who has regulatory authority? And the other complication here is that many of these um, spill over national borders. So Bitcoin can be used basically by anybody with an internet connection anywhere in the world without necessarily having to go to an American exchange or say a Chinese exchange or an Afghani uh, exchange. So um, there are many cross-border issues as well that will have to be dealt with. Uh, in trying to regulate cryptocurrencies and related products. And uh, I think the regulatory community right now is facing this difficult challenge of trying to think about whether they can take existing regulations and sort of tweak them um, to apply to the new products, or if we need uh, a fundamental change in certain sorts of regulations in order to encompass these new products and services. Um, you mentioned El Salvador earlier. El Salvador's government has made a decision making Bitcoin a legally accepted currency. How will trade with other countries be affected? So it's hard to imagine traders in other countries being willing to accept Bitcoin as payments given its um, um, very unstable value. Um, as we were discussing earlier um, in response to Frank's question, um, I think um, what El Salvador is hoping that if it manages to acquire um, a significant amount of Bitcoin and the value of Bitcoin goes up, it is going to be able to use those Bitcoins, perhaps by converting them into hard currency such as the US dollar uh, to pay for more um, imports. Um, but I don't think Bitcoin is really going to be um, uh, workable for these large scale um, transactions um, because there are still significant concerns about whether it will maintain um, stable value or not. So if you're, you know, if um, if it's AMC accepting, um, you know, payments for theater tickets using Bitcoin, um, the fluctuations might affect its revenues somewhat. But for a trader, an exporter, an importer, um, you know, paying in Bitcoin or accepting payments in Bitcoin, those uh, fluctuations could either lead to enormous profits or uh, drive people out of business. And that's not the sort of risk I suspect many traders want to take. So. I don't anticipate Bitcoin playing a big role in legitimate cross-border transactions, especially for large volume, large value trade transactions. Thank you. What are your thoughts on Ross Ulbricht, operator of the dark net market Silk Road? Did he deserve the sentence he was given? <laughs> uh, 
So I, I think uh, those matters of jurisprudence are beyond my um, uh, my ken. But what I will say is that um, uh, it is interesting how the um, uh, Silk Road was actually fueled to some extent by Bitcoin. It's sort of like um, uh, the comparison between how um, PayPal um, helped the rise of eBay, uh, because PayPal used to be the main payment mechanism for eBay at one point, and um, you know. Uh, we may not all remember the days of the origins of PayPal and eBay, but when uh, eBay was trying to become a viable platform for um, exchanges of goods and services, uh, you needed um, an easy to use payment platform and PayPal uh, provided that, so they sort of grew together. Uh, the same thing happened with Bitcoin in the early days. It was used largely for these nefarious activities, and that was when the dark web was really uh, getting on its feet. Um, so the two sort of grew up symbiotically uh, before uh, it turned out that Bitcoin really uh, was not uh, providing the sort of anonymity that many of these um, uh, people engaged in illicit commerce believed. So uh, its use for those purposes um, quickly trailed off. Thank you. Uh, this questioner says, currency is a credit instrument requiring widespread trust, value, stability, fungibility, and efficiency in allowing the reliable valuation of transactions without much cost for the instrument quantifying the transaction. I have trouble understanding how Bitcoin fits those criteria, especially since there are very few people who even begin to understand how it works, much less trust it as a currency. Is this just another case of tulips in Holland? Yeah, so the questioner, um, you know, very concisely and clearly uh, described the key attributes of the currency uh, in its role as a medium of uh, um, exchange, but also as a store of value, because ultimately um, the value of something and especially its ability to retain value over time uh, depends on trust. Um, and what Bitcoin was trying to do was uh, replace trust in a public institution or commercial bank uh, with trust. Um, in sort of this public consensus mechanism, that is to say the entire community uh, could agree um, on certain valuations, um, on how certain transactions were valid or not. And I don't think that's a viable um, way to conduct uh, uh, a currency in its role as a store of value. Um, so at some level, and this has been a theme of what I've been saying so far, um, uh, Bitcoin does seem to be largely a speculative bubble, but you know, in history, there have been many examples, even in recent history, of um, bubbles lasting for a very long time. Um, but the concern I have really is not that uh, uh, there are risks, but uh, really that there are people who are getting into this who don't fully understand the risks. Um, and they are the ones who might be putting their life savings on the line and could face pretty serious financial risks in the future. Thank you so much. Well, we're almost at the end of the hour, so I will probably wrap this up and Frank turn this back over to you. But Dr. Prasad, thank you so much for all of your insight. And I know this is a complicated topic for us. So hopefully uh, we just scratch the surface and we'll have to have you back in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Jessica. And, and um, something that's come to mind, Dr. Prasad, um, what happens if the internet goes down, Dr. Prasad, you can't get onto Coinbase or, or Robinhood to, to access your crypto? That is an important question. You know, this is, uh, I have a section in my book says, cash always comes through in a pinch, you know, when there are natural disasters, when uh, Katrina, uh, Hurricane Katrina struck, um, there are cases when it's very difficult to um, avoid the use of cash. Now, uh, here too, technology is beginning to play a role. There are um, uh, tele uh, telephone app-based payment systems where even if you don't have access to a communication network, uh, just through near field communication, that is by having two uh, cell phones um, in close co uh, contact with each other, you can conduct transactions and eventually that get validated once you have access to the communications network. But certainly um, the tangible element of cash the fact that you can use it without reliance on any digital devices, on any communications network, still leaves it with some advantages in a doomsday scenario. Dr. Ishwar Prasad, author of The Future of Money, thank you for this uh, education today on this subject and uh, enlightening us on this uh, important uh, topic and uh, very much look forward to staying in touch with you uh, as this entire uh, topic evolves. Thank you again very, very much uh, for joining us here today. I'll turn the program back over to your president, Kim McClary. But first, let me just thank you, Frank, for a very uh, nice conversation, for guiding it so well. And I should also thank the Los Angeles World Affairs Council for so graciously hosting me on this uh, event. I very much appreciate it, Kim. 
Dr. Prashad, that was so fascinating. We have to have you both back because this is such a continuing story. And I, Frank, I so appreciate you moderating today. You did a superb job. And please, as Frank said, uh, let's pick up a copy of The Future of Money, How the Digital Revolution is Transforming Currencies and Finance. Thank you both for your time and expertise today. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, and thank you to all those of you who were on this uh, on this call. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. For our viewers, we have a terrific lineup of upcoming programs. Let me just run through them quickly. Uh, and you can register for all of these at our website at lawacth.org. Next week, Politics in the Time of Coronavirus on Tuesday with Dan Schnur. It's now at 5 p.m. September 29th, A Diplomat's Bold Vision for the Future of United Arab Emirates. October 1st, U.S.-Australian Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. October 4th, On Tyranny, Is Democratic Republic on the Brink of Authoritarian, or Is Our Democratic Republic on the Brink of Authoritarianism? A conversation with Edison International President and CEO Pedro Pizarro is on October 7th. This will focus on California's pivotal climate change movement. On the 13th, Risk, a user's guide of general, with General Stanley McChrystal. And on the 15th, a conversation with Dr. Fiona Hill, who many of you know as is the Senior Director of European and Russian Affairs at the United Nations National Security Council. Please register today, become a member, make a donation. We can't do this without you. Take care and see you next week. Thanks everyone.